In the wake of North Korea repeatedly sending trash through balloons across the border, South Korea's military warns that it'll take stern military action if the regime's provocations cross the line. A set of deals were signed between South Korea and the Czech Republic to forge a nuclear power alliance as President Yoon song yeol wrapped up his recent trip to the Central European country. Israel and Hezbollah have been engaged in a major conflict since the outbreak of the war in Gaza. The two sides continue exchanging heavy fire. It's September 23rd, 6 p.m. in Seoul. This is News Center. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung-min. We start with North Korea repeatedly sending trash-carrying balloons towards the south. This time, some 30 balloons landed in the South Korean territory. The military in Seoul sent a strong warning today, saying it'll take stern action if those pose a serious threat to people here. Our defense correspondent Pei yun -ji explains more. Several trash-carrying balloons were spotted flying over Yongsan on Monday morning, near South Korea's presidential office in Seoul. They were launched by North Korea on Sunday evening, as the regime resumed its balloon campaign, four days after a similar launch was made. Around 30 balloons carrying trash, paper and plastic bottles landed in parts of Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province on Monday. Some of them even temporarily led to suspended flights at Incheon International Airport. South Korea's military, which has refrained from directly shooting down the balloons, has said it will not hesitate to take action if the balloons pose a serious threat to South Korean nationals. If the trash balloons from North Korea pose a serious threat to the safety of our citizens or cross the line, our military will take stern action. It added that the fundamental measure to put an end to the balloon campaign is to demonstrate that the enemy can gain nothing from them but declined to further elaborate on exactly when the military would determine that the North has crossed the line or what the response measures would be. According to the JCS, North Korea has sent a total of 5,500 trash balloons since late May. They have been sending these balloons to protest against the anti-Pyongyang propaganda campaign by North Korean defectors and activists in South Korea, who regularly send over balloons carrying food, money and leaflets criticizing the North leaders. In a tit-for-tat response, the South has been using frontline loudspeakers to blast broadcast of propaganda messages and K-pop songs. Peun-ji, Arirang News. Leaders of the Quad Security Dialogue have condemned North Korea's ballistic missile launches and its pursuit of nuclear weapons. In a statement following their summit in Wilmington, Delaware this past weekend, the heads of the U.S., Australia, India and Japan also urged the regime to abide by U.N. Security Council resolutions and to refrain from further provocations as well to engage in dialogue. The Wilmington Declaration also shared concerns about North Korea's military cooperation with Russia and commitment to rid the Korean Peninsula of nuclear weapons. Also in the U.S., the top diplomats of South Korea, the United States and Japan will meet on the sidelines of the annual U.N. General Assembly in New York on Monday. This will be the first meeting in seven months between South Korean Foreign Minister Cho tae his U.S. counterpart Antony Blinken and Japanese counterpart Yoko Kamikawa. They last held talks at the G20 summit in Brazil this February. The three are expected to look at trilateral security cooperation, following up on agreements made at the Camp David summit, as well as discussing North Korea's recent provocations. In other news, a host of deals have been sealed between Seoul and Prague on nuclear energy partnership and more during President Yu's visit to the Czech Republic last week. Our top office correspondent Wu Suyong files this report. South Korea and the Czech Republic adopted a joint action plan and dozens of deals to forge a so-called century-long nuclear power alliance. This came as President Yoon song yeol made a three-day official visit to Prague. After the Czech government selected the South Korean consortium as the preferred partner to build two nuclear units at its Dukovny power plant, Yoon's trip aimed to lay the groundwork to secure the final contract. 
with the two governments agreeing on a set of joint measures to develop their strategic partnership, which marks a 10-year milestone in 2025. The signing of 13 memorandums of understanding related to nuclear cooperation signifies that the institutional foundation has been firmly established. The Korea-Czech Nuclear Power Alliance means cooperation across the entire nuclear ecosystem, including technology, operations, research and development and workforce training. Regarding complications posed by US firm Westinghouse, which claims intellectual property rights over Korean nuclear reactor designs, the official hinted Seoul is working with Washington to overcome the dispute and forge a win-win partnership. The Korea-US Global Nuclear Alliance means we will cooperate to enhance energy security and enter the global nuclear market through highly efficient, clean energy and nuclear power in response to the climate crisis. With over 50 MOUs concluded during his trip, Yun also sought to ramp up cooperation with Prague in areas beyond nuclear energy. The bilateral trade and investment promotion framework aims not only to expand trade and investment, but also collaborations across various industries. A new supply chain and energy dialogue will cover advanced manufacturing, supply chains, carbon-free and civil nuclear energy. Further deals aim to foster cooperation in batteries, railroads and transport infrastructure, and reconstruction projects in Ukraine. Joint research and development between academic institutions will expand roughly 20-fold, with South Korea increasing its contribution to 37 million US dollars over the next decade. Joint research areas will expand from mainly bio, chemicals and materials to common areas of interest, such as aerospace, nuclear energy, AI, digital and quantum science and technology. Competence in advanced science and technology is directly linked to national competitiveness, and recently global cooperation has been reorganized among countries with shared values. Underpinning all areas of cooperation are the two countries' shared values of freedom, democracy and rule of law amid growing geopolitical rifts and challenges. In this regard, they agree to work together to develop standards on cyberspace, collaborate on defence, and promote closer cooperation between Korea and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Prague also expressed support for Yoon's approach to peaceful unification with North Korea and efforts to denuclearize the regime. Marking 35 years of diplomatic relations next year, Seoul and Prague will implement their joint action plan for strategic partnership until 2027. Woo Seung, Arirang News, Prague. South Korea's exports for the first 20 days of September fell despite surging semiconductor exports. According to data from the Korea Customs Service on Monday, the total value of exports for those 20 days came to 35.6 billion U.S. dollars. That's a drop of just over 1 percent compared to the same period last year. This comes as a result of fewer working days due to the Chuseok holiday. However, the average exports per working day surged 18 percent on year. While items like cars, petroleum products and steel saw declines, semiconductor exports jumped more than 26 percent. Despite the overall dip so far, a positive export trend is expected for the month, given the remaining number of working days and the typical year-end surge. In the Middle East, Israel and Hezbollah continue exchanging heavy fire amid fears of an expanded all-out war. Choi Soo-hyung has more. The Israeli military said it carried out large airstrikes in Lebanon against Iran-backed Hezbollah on Monday morning. This was in response to detecting Hezbollah's plan to launch a major rocket attack in Israel. According to Lebanese media outlets, heavy airstrikes were seen in southern Lebanon, including the eastern Bekaa Valley and the northern region near Syria. Israeli military spokesperson Daniel Hagari said on Monday that geographically widespread bombing is underway in order to return northern Israel's residents to their homes safely, which Israel had announced as a new aim of the war. The IDF will engage in extensive precise strikes 
against terror targets which have been embedded widely throughout Lebanon. The Hezbollah terrorist organization has been continuously launching attacks on Israeli civilians and has no plans to stop. He also stated that they will do whatever is necessary to achieve this. And he called on residents of southern Lebanon to keep away from Hezbollah posts. This comes after Hezbollah on early Sunday launched its deepest rocket attacks towards Israel since the outbreak of the Gaza war in retaliation for the mass Peja and walk Turkey explosions last week. Reports say over 140 rockets were fired into northern Israel. Israel says most rockets were intercepted while four people were injured from the attacks. Israel also launched hundreds of strikes on Lebanon as a senior Hezbollah official declared an open-ended battle was underway with both sides on the brink of an all-out war. The rocket attacks also followed Friday's Israeli airstrike in the Lebanese capital Beirut that killed at least 45 people, including 16 Hezbollah militants. In response to the growing conflict in the Middle East, U.S. President Joe Biden said on Sunday that Washington will do everything it can to prevent a bigger war. Earlier on the same day, White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby told ABC that the U.S. does not believe a military conflict or an escalation of the war is in the best interest of Israel, adding that Washington is holding direct discussions with the Israelis. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he fears the possibility of transforming Lebanon into another Gaza. Che Tiong, Arirang News. Staying in the Middle East, a gas leak causes a tragic blast at a coal mine in Iran, killing dozens of people. Yi Yunjin reports. Iranian state media said Sunday that 51 people were killed in an explosion at a coal mine in Iran's South Khorasan province, 540 kilometers southeast of the capital Tehran. The explosion which occurred, according to IRNA News, in blocks B and C of a section of the Tabas mine, operated by a private Iranian firm, the Madanju Company, at 9 p.m. on Saturday night, also left around 20 people injured. The governor of South Khorasan said there were 69 workers in the blocks at the time of the explosion, 22 people in block C and 47 in block B, adding that it's unclear how many survivors are trapped inside the mine. Reports also said the explosion was caused by a methane gas leak. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and President Masoud Pazeshkian expressed condolences to the families of the victims, with the president adding that the best efforts would be made to follow up on the situation. A local prosecutor said gas accumulation in the mine has made search operations difficult, but that the priority was to help those injured and recover people from under the rubble. Ordering an investigation into the incident, authorities said potential negligence and fault for the explosion would be dealt with at a later date. Meanwhile, Iran's labor minister told state media that the mine went through inspections last month and there were no safety regulation violations. With 76 percent of the country's coal coming from this region, the Tabas coal mine covers an area over 30,000 square kilometers and, according to the IRNA, is considered the richest and largest coal area in Iran. But Iran's mining sites have seen accidents rather frequently. In 2017, an explosion at a coal mine killed 43 miners, while another last year, likely caused by a methane gas leak, resulted in six deaths. AP News stated that lack safety standards and inadequate emergency services in mining areas were often to blame. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Vice President Kamala Harris stands slightly ahead of former President Donald Trump in the latest public survey. And the sentiment in swing states remains even more closely contested. An Song Jin with the details. With around 40 days left till the 2024 U.S. presidential election, the two candidates are seeing a neck-and-neck -neck race. Democratic nominee Kamala Harris is enjoying a slight lead in a recent CBS poll released on Sunday, which was conducted on more than 3,000 registered voters. Though within the margin of error, 52 percent of voters responded in favor of Harris, while 48 percent went for Trump. In individual battleground states, the difference was even less. In a poll conducted on voters from seven swing states, including Pennsylvania, Michigan and Nevada, Harris was ahead by one to two percentage points compared to the former president. This comes as heated exchanges continue between the two candidates, including the call for a second debate. Harris has accepted an invitation from CNN to participate in another debate with her counterpart, 
as she said to release new economic proposals this week. Well, you probably heard I would like another debate, so I'm hoping the former vice president will agree to that. But we have a lot more to discuss. However, Trump has turned this down. The problem with another debate is that it's just too late. Voting has already started. Meanwhile, in a recent appearance on TV, Trump stated that he will not run in the 2028 presidential elections if he loses. If he wins this election in November, based on the Constitution, he will be unable to run for a third term. This implies that regardless of the election results, the 2024 election will be Trump's last. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Last Friday, the U.S. marked an annual day to honor its hero heroes of war who could not make the journey back home from the front lines, including those who went missing during the Korean War. A similar event also took place in Seoul. As our Kim jong sil reports, the event was smaller in scale, yet poignant. Every year on the third Friday of September, Americans across the country honor U.S. soldiers who became prisoners of war or were designated missing in action. But this year, a new step was taken. On September 20th, U.S. President Joe Biden designated the date as National POW MIA Recognition Day. The day serves as a reminder of over 81,000 American men and women who remain missing from conflicts around the world, including more than 7,400 from the Korean War. In Seoul at the War Memorial of Korea, a ceremony was held over the weekend. U.S. soldiers, chaplains, South Korean citizens and supporters came together to remember those who never made it home. A solitary table was set with empty plates and glasses, symbolizing the absence of those still missing. Participants stood together as names were read aloud as a reminder of the 7,465 soldiers. Colonel Martin Cho, garrison chaplain at USAG Humphreys, said he feels a mixture of sadness and gratitude. Thanksgiving coming up, but they have no those family members together, so very uh, up and down emotion today. But I'm so happy today we held this historical event in Korea. Remember together 7697 chairman Han Jong-un's mother was pregnant in Hwangedo province during the war. Wanting to leave due to the bitter cold, their fate changed when a couple of U.S. soldiers helped them board a train heading to the south. When I saw the remains of U.S. soldiers return from North Korea in 2018, I thought maybe those who saved my parents could be among them. That moment changed everything for me. As the U.S. continues its efforts to account for all missing soldiers, events like these serve as reminders that these men and women are not forgotten. Chairman Han and others say they are committed to ensuring their legacy lives on. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Time now to take a look at what's been happening in the world of sports. Joining us, our sports editor, Paul Need. Hi, Paul. Hello there. Let's first start with football. Tottenham Hotspur returned to winning ways on Saturday, helped by Son Heung Min. Yes, uh, he got two assists in a 3 1 win over Brentford. He first teed up Brennan Johnson on 28 minutes, and then James Madison on 85, helping Spurs come back from a goal down. And with those two assists, Son is now on 64 and has moved up to second in Tottenham's all-time assist record in the Premier League era, overtaking Christian Eriksen. Four more and he'll overtake Darren Anderton. Son is also now 18th on the Premier League's all-time assist list. Spurs, though, they sit 10th in the Premier League, following seven points from their first five matches. Meanwhile, in the Bundesliga, Kim Min Jae played the full 90 minutes of Bayern Munich's 5 0 win over Werder Bremen. Centre back Kim was in fine form. According to FOTMOB, his passing accuracy was at 92%. He won both of his tackles, both of his ground duels, and all five of his aerial duels. And German media outlet Terset gave him a rave review. With the win, Bayern made it four from four to start the new season. And staying with football, North Korea's uh, under-20 women's team has won the World Cup. 
Yes, that's right. They earned a 1-0 win over Japan in the final at Estadio El Campín in Bogotá, Colombia on Sunday local time. A Chael Son goal in the 15th minute was the difference between the two sides. This is North Korea's third title overall. 17-year-old Che also won the Golden Boots, having ended the competition as the top scorer with six. North Korea won every single match, scored 25 goals and conceded just four in seven matches. And moving into uh, baseball in Korea's KBO League, uh, the postseason is just around the corner. It is indeed, yes, and the Kia Tigers have already earned the best record in the regular season. This means they're already through to the Korean series. They've been joined by the Samsung Lions too, who earned their spot on Sunday thanks to an 8-9 win over the Kium Heroes. LG Twins need just one more win to seal their spot, which could be as soon as tomorrow when they take on the SSG Landers. Once the regular season concludes at the end of September, fourth will play fifth in the wild card. The winners then face third. Then the winners of that face the will go ahead with the Samsung Lions, who finished in second. Then it is the Korean series. Lots to look forward to then. And uh, finally, to golf, another LPGA Tour win for Lydia Ko. Yes, uh, she won the Kroger Queen City Championship, presented by P&G. Born in Seoul, the New Zealander on Sunday in Mainville, Ohio, finished 23 under par, five strokes clear of Ataya Titikun of Thailand. This is despite Ko being two shots behind heading into the final round. But a final round nine under 63 was what sealed it for her. It's caused third LPGA win of this year, second in a row and 22nd overall. The last time she won two in a row was back in 2016. All right. Thanks for that, Paul. See you next week. Thank you. As the morning temperatures drop, fairly cool autumn weather has arrived. For the time being, large daily temperature differences of 10 to 15 degrees are expected, so make sure to bring a thin jacket when you're heading out. It's raining on and off on Jeju Island. Tomorrow between morning and day, it will rain a bit on Jeju Island. In addition, Jeju is expected to receive up to 20 millimeters of rain on Wednesday. By Wednesday, the east coast, the coastlines of Gyeongsangdo provinces, and the coastal areas of Jeju Island will be flooded with waves. High waves can cross seawalls or coastal roads, so please be careful when approaching waterfronts. Tomorrow's Seoul and Gyeongju will start off at 16 degrees Celsius. Daily highs will move up to 27 in Seoul, Daejeon, and Daegu. Gwangju, Busan, and Jeju, 28 degrees. There will be mostly sunny weather in inland areas this week. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. And that is the center for tonight.
Thank you for watching. A panel session coming up.